you have your Bible, I want to invite you to flip with me to the next book of the New Testament, Romans, verse 18. And if you're taking notes, I want to share with you briefly five reminders that our souls need in seasons of waiting. As I reflect on these three and a half years of waiting in my life, and I, I say briefly because any one of these reminders could be a standalone sermon, easy. And as I mentioned, this will be a bit unique because all five of these reminders don't even come directly from this passage in Romans 8, though they're summarized here and they definitely come straight from God's Word in ways that I've seen and studied over the last three and a half years. I would recommend a book that has been a constant companion to me over the last three and a half years by Andrew Murray called Waiting on God. It's a short, simple book. It's, it's not intended to even be read just in a setting or sitting. Like it's, it's intended to be just walked through slowly. Every chapter just picks, uh, it's just a couple pages in a chapter, picks a place in the Bible that talks about waiting and just meditates on it. It's been super helpful for me, pointing me to God's Word. That leads to Romans 8, 18 through 30. And I want to read this passage, and I'll have it up here on the screen as well. And I want you to notice three times when this passage mentions waiting. So maybe in your Bible, you might circle it or just make a note every time you see wait. So Romans chapter 8, verse 18. This is God's Word. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Isn't that interesting? That the Bible links waiting with adoption. That as followers of Jesus, we are waiting for our adoption as children of God, which actually then makes the entire Christian life a life of waiting. And you might think, but aren't we already adopted? Aren't we already children of God? And the answer is, biblically, yes. We all who have repented and believed in Jesus as Lord are adopted as sons and daughters of God, but we are waiting to be fully united with our Father in heaven, our family there. And this is a lot like, in many ways, the situation our family has been walking through the last three and a half years. The match had been made. The relationship was real. JD was our son, but we weren't together yet. And now we're together. His adoption is complete. And this is what we're waiting for as followers of Jesus. We have a real relationship with God as our Father, but we're waiting to be with Him fully, which means we're longing and groaning and hoping, to use language from Romans 8, for the day when our adoption will be complete and we're home. So the question is, how do we not lose heart in the waiting? How do you hold fast to faith in the waiting? 
And here are five reminders that I want to encourage you with today that God has reminded me of over these last three and a half years and specifically the last few weeks. Number one, remember that God is sovereign over everyone and everything. When you're waiting, remember, God is sovereign. That word means he has all authority over everyone and everything. In other words, he is ultimately in control, which means that things, circumstances, are never out of control. Even hard things. Did you notice in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility. So that's passive voice. It was subjected, which begs the question, well, who subjected the creation to futility? Did Satan do that? Well, look at the rest of the verse. Because of him who subjected it, so this is the one who subjected it, in hope. Satan doesn't do anything in hope that the creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. God is sovereign over this whole picture, over everyone and everything in creation. And the rest of this passage makes this both clear and personal to us. In verse 28, one of the most well-known verses in the book of Romans, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Do you know what the Greek word that's translated all things there means? It means all things. <laughs> everything. Everything. Without exception. Even hard things. Even the worst things. God will work together for good. Because God is sovereign over all things. And God has a purpose in all things. Which leads right into verses 29 and 30 in the big picture of God to conform us into the image of his son Jesus. And ultimately to glorify us with him. Do you realize what this passage is telling us? What God is saying to us right now. That he is always working all things together for his purpose that is far bigger than any one thing. And this is so important to remember. This morning here at Tyson's, we've sung a song here called Never Lost about how God doesn't lose battles. And I remember one day a few years ago singing, I would say yelling in the car, that song, as it was looked like maybe we were gonna get to go. And then it didn't happen. I remember struggling, like looking back to that moment, like, God, you never lose. And so why, why are we still here? Why are we still waiting? And the problem was, I was only seeing part of the picture. And God sees it all. And sometimes God gives us glimpses of the bigger picture. Let me show you a, a picture from when we were overseas the last few weeks. Uh, it's not like that great uh, scene. It's just walking through a hotel hallway. But I snapped a picture because I was so struck. When you look on the left side of this picture, you see our daughter Mara, who came home from China 12 years ago after God had used long years of waiting for children to open our hearts to adoption in the first place. She's holding the hand of a little girl named Mercy, who without going into the whole story now, would not even be in our family if JD's adoption had not been postponed. And then Mercy is holding the hand of her new older brother that she now hugs and kisses and sometimes annoys nonstop. So this, this is a story that only a sovereign God can write. And I am not saying that every story ends in this world this way or that way with a tidy bow on it. I'm not even saying there's a, that this bow is that tidy. What I am saying is what the Bible is saying. God is sovereign over everyone and everything, which means that you and I can always trust he is working all things together for his purpose. And his purpose is our good. 
and ultimately our glory with him. In other words, it's true. In the end, it will be clear. God does not lose. And in the end, all who trust in him will experience his victory. Which actually leads to the second reminder. I really need to pick up the pace here. Uh, So remember, don't forget, don't ever forget in the waiting, one, that God is sovereign over everyone and everything. Number two, remember that God loves you more than you know. He is your father who has adopted you, after all, in love for you. Did you see that word in Romans 8, 29, predestined? There's a lot we could talk about there and in other places like Ephesians 1. The language there is that God chose us before the foundation of the world in love. He predestined us to adoption as his children. Remember this in the middle of your waiting. Amidst the weakness you feel, the challenges you face, especially on the days when you're tempted to lose heart, lack faith, or maybe give up because the longing or the hurt or the pain or the sorrow is so heavy, remember this. Remember that before the sun was ever even formed, before mountains were ever laid on the earth or oceans poured forth on the land, before a star was even set in the sky, Almighty God set his sight on your soul. I'll knock you out of your seat if you really think about it. God decided to adopt you. He loves you more than you know. I was reading just a couple Weeks ago, Psalm 56, verse 8 and 9, at this low point in David's life when he writes, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. Do you see this? When you can't sleep at night, he sees you. When the tears flow, he holds them. He loves you so much. And no, remember this. God is for me you. In the waiting, don't doubt the weight of God's love for you. And not just you. So, number three, remember that God loves others more than you do. And I have needed this reminder when I prayed for my son and wondered, God, why is the door not opening to go to him? I have needed to remember over and over and over again that God loves JD more than I do. God has reminded me who he is, Psalm 68, verse 5. He is father of the fatherless and protector of widows in his holy habitation. That's who he is in heaven. And this, obviously, an adoption, but on a broader sense, may this be an important reminder because oftentimes, Our waiting does involve others' lives. We're waiting with others, for others, on behalf of others, longing for the good of others. And we can, if we're not careful, start to question not just God's love for us, but God's love for them. And it's good to remember that God loves others more than we do. God is love. And remembering that leads to the fourth and I would say most important reminder. Remember that God is the goal. I have needed to be reminded over and over again the last three and a half years that adoption is not the goal. Because if Heather and I thought if only we could get JD, then we would be happy, or then everything would be all right, then we would be missing the point. Because as long as the goal is a change in our circumstances, then we are making an idol out of our circumstances. We're looking to this or that to fulfill us when only God can fulfill us. The goal is not adopting or having a child or getting married, or this disease, or sickness ending, or that situation being resolved. The goal is God. 
This is so important. It's critical. And it's why Romans 8 talks about waiting for the day when our adoption is complete, when we are what? With God. Just think about how the rest of the Bible talks about waiting. Psalm 27, verse 14 summarizes it. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage as you wait for the Lord. And you remember earlier in the same chapter, Psalm 27, verse 4? One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Do you see that one thing I want? To see the Lord. In waiting, we need to remind ourselves he is the one thing that we need. And as a result, he is the one thing we need to want. Above all, above adoption, above reconciliation, above healing for our bodies, above an end to the hurt or pain or sorrow or struggle, whatever it is, above all, we need and want God. So here's some practical encouragement in times of waiting that flow from this reminder, if God is the goal, then let waiting lead you to deeper intimacy with God. Listen to Psalm 62. For God alone, there it is again, my soul waits in silence. Why? Because from him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He's my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. When God is the goal, when God is your rock, then you will not, you cannot be shaken. So let waiting lead you to deeper intimacy with him. Let waiting lead you to greater dependence on God. We all feel our weakness in our waiting, right? We want to change things, but we can't. We're limited. We are weak. And what does Romans 8, 26 say? The Spirit helps us in our weakness. And then listen to Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31, one of my favorite passages from the last few years. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who, what? Wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What language? What's the, how do you go from weariness to soaring like an eagle? You wait for the Lord. And I remember meditating on this passage at one point over these years, doing a deep dive into this word, wait. And one resource I came across said that this word rate, wait, and I'm going to write it down just to emphasize that this word wait could be translated to rest trustfully. To rest trustfully. And I've held on to that phrase. I want to rest trustfully in you, God, in the middle of the waiting. Waiting leads us to depend on, to rest trustfully in God. A couple of other practical encouragements when it comes to God being the goal. If God's the goal, then let waiting lead you to grow in holiness before God. There are so many temptations to sin in waiting. So many temptations to think, to live, to speak in a place that does not come from faith. And so listen to Psalm 37, verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Again, fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off. Those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. What a good word. Guard yourself against fretting. 
against worry in the waiting, and refrain from anger, forsake wrath, avoid evil. Be on guard against sin in the waiting. In all the ways the adversary wants to use your waiting to pull you away from God. Let waiting lead you to grow in holiness before God. And in the process, so one more word of encouragement, with God as your goal, let waiting lead you to give more glory to God. This is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Wait on the Lord and you will not be put to shame. You will never regret waiting on the Lord. You will never regret resting trustfully in God. In all these ways, remember, God is the goal. Which leads to this last reminder. Remember that God is at work. He's at work. Romans 8, 18 to 30, it's filled with awesome ways God's working in our waiting. By his spirit, he's helping us. He's interceding for us when we don't know how to pray. As we've talked about, he's working all things together for our good. In other words, God is not waiting. God is working. So I want to encourage you. Because God is at work, as you wait, never stop praying with faith. Because you'll be tempted to stop praying. And you'll be tempted to think, what good is praying going to do? Because I've prayed and nothing's happened. Never stop praying with faith. One of the other texts I've come back to over and over again the last few years is Luke 18, verse 1. Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's a good word. Keep praying, Jesus says. Don't lose heart. Why? Because God is working. And if God is working, then we can and must pray with faith. One, in who God is. This parable in Luke 18 goes on to talk about the character of God. I I found in waiting that we're tempted specifically to lack faith in the power, the love, and or the wisdom of God. God, aren't you powerful enough to change this? God, if you're loving, why is this still happening? And God, this makes no sense to me. I don't see the wisdom in this. And it is good to pray with faith, to express our desires to him. God, I want to bring my son home. We prayed that every single day for three and a half years. But in the next breath to say, God, I trust you're able to do this, your power. I trust your love for JD and for us and so many others in this picture. And I trust your wisdom that you're working in ways I don't see. I'm not going to stop praying with trustful rest and the all powerful, all loving, all wise God overall, who is working in ways we don't see. So don't stop praying with faith in who God is and what God can do. Don't doubt for a second in the waiting what God can do. Don't lose heart. You are praying to the God of the impossible. So don't stop praying with faith in what God can do and ultimately in what God will do, which is where the end of this passage in Romans 8 ends for all who are trusting restfully in God as he brings us one day to glory with him, specifically for those who are trusting in Jesus. I want to get to those verses in Romans 8 to close, but before I do that, I I do want to ask every single person in the sound of my voice right now, have you put your trust in Jesus? Because, here's the deal, here's the big picture story. We live in a world of waiting because we live in a world of sin and corruption and sorrow. Just like Romans 8 is talking about, 
where so many things are not as they should be and where suffering and pain and hurt and unfulfilled longings are a reality for every one of us. And all of this is ultimately because there is sin in the world and sin in each of our hearts. We live in a world where we have all turned aside from God and his ways to ourselves and our own ways. And as a result of sin, we are separated from God. And if we die in this state of sin, we will actually spend eternity in suffering, separated from God. But the good news of the Bible, the greatest news in the world, is that God loves us so much that he has come to us in the person of Jesus. And Jesus has done what none of us could do. He has lived a life of no sin. And then even though he had no sin for which to die, he came to die on a cross, to pay the price for our sins, to die as a substitute in our place. And then three days later, he rose from the grave. Jesus is victorious over sin, suffering, and death itself so that anyone, anywhere who repents and believes, who turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus and his love for you will be forgiven of all your sin and restored to relationship with God as your heavenly father, adopted into the family of God to be with him forever and ever and ever. Have you put your trust in Jesus? And if the answer to that question is not, yes in your heart, then I invite you today, let today be the day God speaking to your heart right now saying he loves you more than you know. Put your trust in him and become a part of his family with God as your heavenly father. And when you do, and for all who have, uh, be reminded when you find yourself waiting in this world, when you find yourself in a position where you are learning to rest trustfully in God, you can know that no matter what this world throws at you, these words from God, the end of Romans 8, are for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died more than that, was raised to life, and is right now at the right hand of God interceding for you? Who will bring any charge? Shall trouble, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus? Shall trouble? or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or fill in the blank? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For we are convinced neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can trust God in the waiting. So will you bow your heads with me all across this room and in other locations? If you've never put your trust in Jesus, as we just enter into a time right now of prayer, I invite you to do that. I invite you to say, like right now, God is speaking to your heart. Say to him in your heart, God, I, I've sinned against you. I'm separated from you. Today, I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin, rose from the dead, so that I can be forgiven of my sin and restored to relationship with you. So yes, God, bring me into your family today. And the Bible teaches by grace from God, through faith in God. We become children of God. God says yes to all who trust in him. When you pray that for all who know God as Father, we just pray, God, help us in our waiting. 
God, forgive us for childish lack of faith that we struggle with, that I confess I struggle with in times of waiting. And you know how I've struggled with it. We praise you for your grace, for your patience with us as your children. And we pray that you would give us, amidst all the circumstances represented in our lives right now, that you would give us childlike faith. God, we trust, we trust your wisdom, your power, and your love. We praise you as the sovereign God who is working all things together for our good and your glory and our glory with you. So bring it about, we pray. Help us when we can't see the bigger picture to trust in you. God, I just pray for so many people who are walking through so many things right now. I pray for your grace, your power, your love, your wisdom, your help over them in their waiting. And we say together, we can't wait for the day when we will see your face, Lord Jesus, and when we will be brought into your presence with no more sin and no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death, no more waiting, and you will wipe every tear from our eyes. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we pray. And help us not to lose heart. Help us to hold faith until that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.